everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 31 of Pop Culturally Debrived, and today we're going to be talking about Spirited Away on your Play With Me or I'll Break Your Arm podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vos. Today we're joined by friend of the show, Catherine Kay. Catherine read Japanese with management studies at Durham University and studied in Japan for one year of that course. She then worked for the local government in Akita Prefecture for three years. Catherine is also the person who introduced me to Studio Ghibli films, so thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. Konnichiwa, Katherine-san. Konnichiwa, Masri-san. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Catherine, why was Spirited Away the film that jumped out to you to, uh, to talk about today? I think it's a film I've been really fond of for um, a number of years. I love um, fantasy, dragons in particular. So for me, the combination of this being a fantastical world, but one which also has a lot of real life touches of the Japanese culture, which I have a lot of affection for having lived there for a little while. um, Both of those were really attracted to me. I also love a film with a female protagonist and I really enjoy the fact that Sen's got her own story to tell. She's not just being rescued by um, a magical prince on a white horse Um, also I really enjoy the fact that the villains are not necessarily black and white it's just that they have some maybe less than um, less than laudable motivations perhaps so so all of that for me made it a really interesting film and it's one I've watched a number of times Um, so hopefully uh, Mandy's enjoyed it too we'll find out (laughs) Mandy how come you've never seen this film before Honestly, I have no good answer for that. I This is not one of those that, that fell into the camp of movies that I just wasn't allowed to watch. I mean, this I think this came out when I was in high school. Um, oh, no, I was in college. This is from 2001. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not that young. <laughs> I was a freshman in college, so I was just out of high school, okay? And, yeah, so I think this is probably just one of those genres that I thought I wouldn't enjoy. And so I just largely ignored it. Well, hopefully you will have enjoyed it. But before we get into the proper discussion, a bit of history. Spirited Away is known as Sen Chihiro no Kamikakushi, which is Sen and Chihiro Spiriting Away in Japan. It is a 2001 animated fantasy film directed by Hayao Miyazaki. The film uses traditional hand-drawn animation techniques and explores themes of capitalism, greed, and the power of names, whilst being told as a coming-of-age tale. Miyazaki wanted to make the film for his daughter and the children of uh, friends of his that would feature a heroine they could admire, but that wasn't purely about romance, something he didn't feel existed for girls of around that age. This film earned 30.4 billion yen at the cinema in Japan, which makes it the highest earning film in the country to this day. And that includes both live action and animated movies, although it looks like Frozen gave it a good run for its money. <laughs> the 30.4 billion yen is about 15 times the production budget and made, it meant that by the time it came out in the States, it was already about $200 million to the good. So that's pretty good for, uh, for a film to open with that behind it. Especially an animated film. Mm. Spirited Away is considered one of the best animated movies ever created and amongst the best films of any format. It won numerous awards, which includes the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature and is still the only Japanese film to have won that category. The year it won, it beat out Disney's Treasure Planet and Lilo and Stitch to do so. In 2017, the New York Times listed Spirited Away as the second best film of the 21st century, and the BBC the year before put it at number four on a similar list. Well, if you are like me and have no idea what this movie is about, because I literally had no idea what the plot of this movie was when I sat down to watch it, um, I shamelessly stole the synopsis from IMDb, which says... During her family's move to the suburbs, a sullen 10-year-old girl wanders into a world ruled by gods, witches, and spirits, and where humans are changed into beasts. So, how did everybody watch this film? I know this is one of those that I think is nearly impossible to find streaming. Mm. So, I had to buy the Blu-ray off of Amazon, and then I ended up watching the English version because that's just what it defaulted to when I pressed play. We watched a DVD that I think I'm going to let Catherine tell the story of. 
So this was actually a DVD that I bought when I was living in Italy after I'd come back from Japan. And um, at the time, I wasn't particularly interested in watching the film in English because I was still very much, oh, I must listen to Japanese. Um, So when Matthew and I came to watch it and Matthew suggested we watch the um, English version, I I did my best to find the English version only to find out that actually all we had was French dubbing. Um, So Matthew got to watch it in Japanese with me with with English subtitles. (laughs) So it is a... Japanese film with English subtitles on an Italian DVD that has a French dub. Okay. <laughs> that sounds all very complicated. Yeah. But uh, I've been told by the good folks on Twitter that the um, Japanese version with subtitles is really the only way to go. And I wish I had had time to watch it twice so I could have watched it both ways. I must say, I'd be really interested to hear the English dubbing as well, because I've, I've never watched it in the English dubbed version, just because I've only ever really watched it on this DVD that I've got. But I'm quite curious to see if there would be any, any differences to notice. And I, I just can't speak to that because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you can message us afterwards once, once you've had the chance to watch it, the dubbed yeah. version. Yeah, I am curious. Uh, one, one of uh, the folks on Twitter said that they hated the English version because they didn't like the actor's voice who played mm. Sin because it, apparently it's very, very different. But for me, it just sounded like a normal little girl. So, I, I, I've had that issue with some of the other Ghibli films, like if, especially if I've watched it once in the Japanese version and I've got, I've got the character sort of set in my mind, especially their voice. And then I might watch it with a friend's child or something like that, and we'll put the English dubbed version on, and and it will be a real shock to the system if if the voice in English isn't isn't doesn't match my mental image of that character. Right. So I, I have some I have some sympathy with that. I I tried it once to watch the uh, dubbed version of My Neighbor Totoro, which is pronounced exactly like that, My Neighbor Totoro, but in the American dub it's Totoro. <laughs> Come play with us, Totoro. It grates a little. That sounds perfectly reasonable to me. (laughs) (laughs) The um, Ghibli films are quite famous for their uh, dubbed versions because they get actors, like proper professional actors, to come and do it. Howl's Moving Castle. Howl himself is played by Christian Bale. Uh, Liam Neeson is in Ponyo. Uh, I think it might even be Reese Witherspoon as one of the girls in Totoro. So they get, you know, established, well-known actors to come and do this. And even the translation of Princess Mononoke, I, I believe, was done by Neil Gaiman. And he actually translated it in such a way that the words they used matched up with the animation they had for what people were speaking. So it didn't, oh. it didn't look like they were speaking a different language. I didn't see in, in this version, it didn't look like they were speaking a different language to me. Um, I was surprised because... My experience with dubbed films are, you know, much older. And, and, <laughs> Old you know, karate movies, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And and so, you know, you've kind of got that, that trope that everybody makes fun of where you've got, you know, these words that you hear not matching up at all with the lips. And so, like, the yeah. words will stop, but the lips will keep going and that sort of thing. That's my experience with English dubbed movies. And so I was kind of expecting that when I sat down to watch this and I didn't get that at all. This felt like a very cohesive movie that I, it felt like I watched it the way it was intended to be watched, even though I know it wasn't because it's a different language, but they did a really good job of bringing it to English, I think. But I think the Oscar that it won I think it was considered the American dubbed version because it wasn't entered as a a film in a foreign language. Okay. Mm. We also wanted to mention that there's been a new deal uh, to reissue the entire Studio Ghibli range to DVD and Blu-ray in North America. The company who will be distributing them, G-Kids, they're also going to be doing a Studio Ghibli Fest, which includes Spirited Away in October and House Moving Castle and others at the cinema. Uh, We're going to put a link to the show notes. If you want to check it out, look up Studio Ghibli Fest on the Fathom Events website. Uh, They are, I would say, genuinely worth watching at the cinema. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So going into this, Mandy, did you have any expectations for this? I didn't, really, other than I did expect it to be, I guess, a low-quality dub for some reason. That's just my expectation (laughs) from my experiences in the past. Um, Like I said before, I literally had no idea what the movie was about. 
all I knew was that it takes place in Japan and it's a cartoon and there's a little girl. Had no idea. So coming into it that blind really left me open for anything. That's good. It's not nice to nice to see it from from afresh because I think if you had known what it was about, I don't know. I don't know whether that would have made a big difference. I don't think so. I because really this. I mean, the story is not that different from an American fantasy story anyway. Mm. I mean, I know it's very deeply rooted in in Japanese culture, but I, I read a lot of fantasy and a lot of you know paranormal romance mm-hmm. and a lot of urban fantasy, and so I just. My fictional tastes are very rooted in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this story ended up being something that I I did actually deeply enjoy. And I feel like had I known that this was actually, you know, about a different reality where spirits are, I would have gone into it expecting to like it. And so I don't Mm -hmm. think it, it would have negatively affected me. And have you any experience with the rest of the Studio Ghibli range, the films of Hayao Miyazaki? No. Okay. Do you have any experience <laughs> of the wider anime? Uh, when I was in high school, uh, one of my world history classes showed us the movie Graveyard of the Fireflies. And all I remember about that movie is that it was set during World War II and it made me cry. Did you know that was actually a Studio Ghibli film? I did not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that was actually that was one of their earlier films. I, I myself haven't seen it yet. I really want to see it, and I think we might even have the DVD downstairs. But what what's putting me off is is getting myself into the right mood because I I am a big crier when when I watch a sad film, and I just know that film's gonna that movie's gonna have me in floods of tears. So it's kind of about finding the, finding the right moment to be prepared for that. Yeah, yeah. I I don't really remember. What it was about, I know there were children in it, it was set during war, and I was really embarrassed because I cried a lot and we were watching this in a classroom. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can imagine I, my reaction would have been very, very similar. <laughs> yeah, so I, I should probably, especially now that, that I've seen Spirited Away, I should probably uh, find this one and go back and rewatch it now when I might have a better appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. And a supply of tissues. <laughs> yes, yes. So having now seen Spirited Away, did you enjoy it? I did. I think I just said that too. I kind of spoiled that a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I did. It it was weird. And if you were following along with me on Twitter at all while I was watching this movie, (laughs) you would have picked up on that. And um, (laughs) I think probably 90% of my thoughts, Doc, are questions. Um, but yeah, I did enjoy it. And by the, by the time the end rolled around and everything kind of got wrapped up, I was, I was right there with everything and it, it did make me cry just a little bit, but it, they were happy tears. I'm, I'm so pleased you like it. I was really worried that we were going to get on here and I'd be, and I'd be defending my favorite film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that fear. Um, especially <laughs> since I'm going through that right now with Matthew and Dr. Who. So I, <laughs> I, I'm pleased that I really liked it and, and we can just talk about it and, and not have to defend the things that we love. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment when I was watching it. Um, I think when you have the, the three stone heads bouncing around mm-hmm. when she first meets you, Baba, and I'm, I'm just thinking, this is so weird. I, I just, you really just have to accept it and run with this film. <laughs> right. Well, and I did. I mean, for me, that really wasn't weird because at that point, it's already been made very clear that we are in a world of ghosts and spirits, and in that kind of mm. world, anything goes. And so, within the setting of the movie, I didn't find it to be weird. I just found the movie as a whole weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense at all. So I said at the beginning that the film was aimed at children. Uh, Miyazaki said he, he'd made Kiki's Delivery Service, which is aimed for a slightly older pre-teen and teen market. He'd made My Neighbor Totoro, which is aimed for a, a younger child market. But he didn't have anything of this turning from child into a slightly more adult way of thinking. Um, so that was that was part of his reasoning behind it. So let's judge it on, on its own terms and in, in its own context. Is this a good film for children? 
I think so. I, I watched it a few times with the Italian kids that I was nannying for when I first bought the DVD. And admittedly, um, the girls in particular are a little bit younger than, than the 10 that Chihiro is supposed to be. But they, they really, really enjoyed it. I think there was enough um, excitement and sort of adventure in there for the literally uh, the three-year-olds to just like the visual spectacle and the older girl I think in, enjoyed the story and enjoyed um, Chihiro sort of getting getting a bit more um, sense of agency and just although obviously she didn't quite express it like that but they, they seem to enjoy it and and I really like I don't know I think there's some nice messages coming through in terms of just sort of having a bit of initiative and um, having the confidence to do stuff. I also liked that the the romance. I hate to call it a romance because I just I thought the relationship between um, Chihiro and Haku. I liked the fact that it seemed to be a very loving friendship. It didn't descend into some kind of weird romance. And a lot of uh, certainly a lot of young young. Japanese manga that I saw when I lived out there that was aimed at young girls was a lot about having crushes on boys at school and and this wasn't like that there was a lot there was a bit more of a sense of purity to it which I liked yeah I I actually agree with all of that I think um I think that he set out what he meant to do by creating a movie that has a heroine that's not wrapped up in a, a guy who kind of stands on mm. her own merit and and kind of grows up and is a strong and capable girl and I really really appreciate that I was concerned at first because she was super super whiny at first and I was concerned about her age you know I I couldn't tell if she was supposed to be like five or twelve you know and and as the movie progressed I could tell that she was actually a little bit older but at first she was so so scared and tearful and whiny that that I did have a few concerns about what am I watching and I hope this gets better. (laughs) But I think by the end, uh, definitely the message of love, not, not a romantic love, but a, you know, platonic friendship, maybe sibling kind of love is kind of what, what she had for Haku and the, the love that the rest of the spirits had for her at the end when they were cheering for her to pick her parents yeah, and, and I think all of that is stuff that we don't see very often, and they are important things for children to see and to understand that not everything has to be romantic, that yeah. you have your own agency and that you can save the day and, and you can do it by yourself. Yeah, I think she's just sort of a very, by, by the end of the film, she was just very direct, but she was also very kind. She was never, you know, she was never sneaky or nasty. Uh, I think every, you know, she, she sort of seemed to to get through by by being kind to people and by doing the right thing. And I think that's a nice message for kids. Definitely. Yeah, she still says thank you and goodbye to you, Baba, as Granny, um, and she still goes and takes care of the No Face, the problem that she creates. So there's a lot of thematic work being done in this film, which you get a lot more in a, in a film for children. The, the themes are a bit more obvious and a bit more on the nose. Um, I talked about it being coming-of-age tale, but having greed and capitalism. Um, do they work? Is it too heavy-handed? Do we like the themes? I think they work. Um, I think one of the things that I had written down in my notes was that everybody in this world is really super helpful. And then I didn't actually follow that up to make it clear that I was being a little bit sarcastic because they were really super helpful (laughs) as long as it served them or got you in trouble, (laughs) you know? And I think that they were very consistent with how they they showed things and and how, you know, everybody was out for themselves, even like the cute creatures, like the, the frog, you know? And the baby, even though he was this creepy giant baby, you know, everything <laughs> yeah. was always about me. And the only people who were helpful could only be genuinely helpful in secret. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you're right there, especially at the beginning when she was an outsider and they didn't quite know know her. I mean, what's what's his, what's he called? Kamaji, the... Um... The boiler house man, I guess, was probably the closest to genuinely being helpful because I don't know that he got anything out of that interaction necessarily. 
um you know he's a bit gruff and grumpy but but i don't you know whereas um whereas the lass that he got to take her up to you baba at least got the crispy newt out of that transaction everything up to that point you know everything at the beginning in particular seemed to be to be about a bargain but i think i think there was a real theme there of of greed greed throughout everything and and for most people at well, most characters in the film who displayed some form of greed whether it's Chihiro's parents stuffing their faces and turning into pigs or um all the all the staff of the bathhouse being absolutely consumed with the greed for the gold that the no face was spitting out and actually some of them ending up getting eaten and and apparently Haku's greed for magical power is what got him under the thrall of Yubaba anyway there seems to be this theme of of a lot of greedy people and greedy for different things but actually that greed gets them into trouble and there's a there's a negative consequence of being so greedy whereas on the other hand um anyone who seems to be willing to work and and put effort in that seems to pay off and i think that there's a bit where um, you know you baba says she has to offer a job to anyone that asks and so so uh, chihiro going in and offering to work and, and being willing to work that's what essentially keeps her alive and stops her being turned into a little piglet the, the soot sprites they themselves um, also are only alive because they're working Right. And Sen Chihiro uh, goes on uh, a nice journey through this and discovering her own confidence. Um, is there a, a moment or is there an incident in this film where she transfers from one to the other? Or is it just a, a general growth throughout the film? I know, for me, I think it's a gradual process. Like, so at the start, she really is, just as just Amanda said, very, very whiny. Uh, the sort of little girl that you really don't want to spend much time with. But at that point, some of the people in the spirit world are kind to her, whether they're paid for that by a newt or not. But they also don't treat her like a child. I think her mother and her parents treat her like a very young, whiny child. And I don't know whether that's sort of cause cause or effect. But once she's got into the spirit world, they don't really give her much choice other than to get on with things. And she does, and things go okay. And then she starts to take some initiative, like with the the stink or the river god, and has some success. And I and I think I think it's a building process. I think it is a, a process, but it starts every time she grows a little bit more. When there is an event where she can help, she wanted to help the the stink god. You know, when she realized that you know, he was in pain and had what she thought was a thorn, you know, she stepped up to help. And then, you know, when Haku was hurt, even though Lynn, the girl's name was Lynn, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, Lynn has been telling her this whole time that you can't trust Haku. He's only working for you, Baba. He's not anything that can be helpful for you. You know, Sen didn't care. And as soon as she saw that he was hurt, she did everything in her power to get to him and to help him. And so I think that she is driven by doing good for other people. And so it was a process that took her from, you know, the whining girl at the beginning to the very end when she says, I think I can handle it. But there were specific instances, I think, that where she made the choice to step up. And it wasn't just she grew into it. It was, I'm scared, but I'm going to do this anyway because somebody needs my help. And I really, really liked that about her character. I quite like that the first thing she does in the film that is her own action that no one's told her to go and do is letting the no-face in, showing a bit of kindness, bring him in. And then a bit later on, she has to go and solve this problem that she's created, And but she just goes and does it. She doesn't try to hide. She doesn't try to cover it up. She just goes and gives him the dumpling um, and and tries to fix him and takes him away to somewhere he'll be happy. Right. That's actually a really good segue into my next question. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so almost everything in this movie does make sense to me. The one thing that I still don't really understand is the character of No Face and what significance he has. I'm not familiar with Japanese culture, so I don't know if this is a representation of something that actually exists, or if this is something that was created for the movie, but I didn't really understand why he was so important. He was driving a lot of the hijinks in the movie, but not 
actually the conflict in the movie. And so I don't really know why he was there or why he was mean to most people because he ate them but still was really kind to Sin. And then, you know, why he was so attached to her both in the beginning and at the end. Like, I just, I don't understand what he has to do with the story, really. Go, go back to the, the start of your question. Is it connected to something in Japanese mythology? If it is, it's nothing that I've seen. But that then I, I am not purporting to be any kind of expert on Japanese mythology or folklore. But it's some of the other gods. I could link them to sort of folk gods from different regions of Japan, just for well, or, or to to something that looks similar to different um, different sort of folklore tales from different areas of Japan. But I've never heard of anything like No Face before. I, I think it's just well. Uh, my guess would be it's something that's just um, invented for the film. I have no good good answer to any of your other questions. <laughs> I think your guess is as good as mine. I mean, but my, my guess is that it's another. Well, I think it's another play on the whole um, whole greed uh, concept. So rather than being greedy for money and power, I think he is greedy for some form of emotional connection, and perhaps he has, you know, the fact that Chihiro has been kind to him by letting him in has made him sort of a little bit um, obsessive about her. But then, of course, he was already staring at her when she was crossing the bridge. So perhaps there's some earlier connection to, to Chihiro that that has made him want her want her kindness, want her friendship. I, 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 you know, he seemed he only he seemed happy when he right at the very end of the film had a sort of a role and a position in life and something to do that wasn't just randomly floating around like a wraith once he'd moved in with Zenny Baba. So, so my take is just some, some form of greed for a space in the world and an emotional connection. Okay, I'll buy it. Since I don't have any other idea what it could be. <laughs> just just listening to you both posing the question and thinking about the question. If, if we're saying some of these are spirits of uh, rivers or towns or, or anything, is he the spirit of greed, of capitalism, of something on those lines? And, and so he's a representation of that. And, and part of his thing is he consumes everyone around him and becomes like them. So Well, I guess... One question then would be, what's the difference between a spirit and a monster? Because they called him a monster and said he wasn't a customer, he's a monster. So what's the difference? Uh, Nobody knows. <laughs> physicality? A monster is always a thing that's real and eats people? A spirit goes there because they need a break and a wash? He said with a question mark? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, every time he got sad, he started to disappear. Mm. Yeah, no idea. I mean, I, I, I would say rather than physicality, I was going for more of a discrimination. I mean, what what is the difference between a spirit and a monster? It's it's whether you like it or dislike it. Perhaps you Baba doesn't like it. We'll call him a monster. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, that's probably that is probably the answer right there. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. We're asking the deep questions here today. It's good. What we need to do is is, is find get get the writer on because I'm not sure I'm not sure many people would have the actual answers to these questions. If if you happen to be listening, please get in touch with us and tell us <laughs> what your story is about. There was an interview with Miyazaki that I read. Uh, so he calls it Kaonashi. Kaonashi, which literally translates as no face. Thank you. Uh, Kaonashi is inside of everyone. These are Miyazaki Hayao's own words. Kaonashi can't buy people's attention with money. In addition, he doesn't know how to hold on to people's hearts. Irritated by Chihiro's lack of desires and tells her to want, there is also a necessity of capitalism. There is a contrast to those who swarm around Ka Kaonashi when he gives out money and Chihiro's enlightened lack of desire for gold or food. Her resolution in this is so strong that it can even seem cold. There is no reasoning behind saving Haku. He clearly says to Kaonashi, I won't give you what I want. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that gives us an answer. And it makes me wonder if Miyazaki himself is trying not to answer it and leave this open to the audience to come up with their own reasoning and thoughts. Well, that's just very tricksy, and I don't like that. <laughs> He's making me use my brain. Yes. Damn him. <laughs> Tell me the answer. You wrote it. What is it supposed to be? Yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, I think Catherine's spot on with, with um, him being 
a bit of a personification of greed because I did note that he really did not like it when Sin said no to him. That's when he got the most agitated mm. and upset. So yeah, I think I think that's a large part of it. Yeah, and then she gives him the dumpling and makes him very, very ill. Yeah, th- that was one supercharged dumpling, wasn't it? <laughs> How many of those things did she have? Yeah, it, it just... It's like limbas bread or something. You only need a bit to give to people. <laughs> I, I think she was breaking bits off it rather than because she only got the one dumpling from the river god. But but yes, she seems that she's had a nibble and decided it tastes horrible. Fed a bit to the cow Nashi, and then suddenly it's the the root of all hearing healing powers for Haku. <laughs> it's like yeah, that's that's an amazing bit of brown lump. <laughs> I was a little bit surprised that. The reaction that she had to it when she tried it, I mean, it was like full body convulsions. <laughs> so I was a little bit surprised that she was willing to shove it down the throats of anybody else. I got the impression it was that along the lines of, well, anything that tastes that, any medicine that tastes that bad has got to be good for you somehow. <laughs> okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the result is it basically made you throw up everything you had inside of you. So I guess it did what it was set up to do. Okay, so it's a good time to talk about some of our favorite things. If we're moving on from the worst thing, the horrible brown dumpling. Uh, Mandy, were there bits of this film that you loved? Any, Any elements of it that were really, really enjoyable? My first favorite thing is the one that all three of us really like, and since I get to talk first, I'm stealing it. <laughs> the uh, You have written down here that they're called soot sprites, and in all of my notes, I called them soot critters, which I like better. But uh, one, they were, just abs- <laughs> <laughs> they were just so cute and adorable, and at first, I didn't realize they were soot. I thought they were little furry spiders, and so whenever... You know, they told us that they were said that made me very, very happy. But when it's when always little, spiders, it is always <laughs> spiders. But but when the first one, you know, his his block of whatever was too heavy for him and it squished him. And Sen's first thought is, oh, let me help this little guy. And uh, all of the other ones realized that that she had just taken this heavy load off of him and. And so they kind of like stop and they kind of look at each other and then they all let their blocks crash down on them so that she has to rescue all of them. And it was so adorable. It's so and, cute. And uh, you use the word cheeky here in the notes. And I think that's exactly the best way to describe it. And it just, it made me laugh and I liked it. And it was nice to finally see something cute after we've been put in this world that's so dangerous for her. So I liked that. And then at the end, the, the, the end of this movie was just fantastic. When when Haku comes to find her at Zenibaba's house and she just runs out and hugs him, I was clapping and like Aww. laughing. And I think it probably did make me cry just a little bit because I was so happy. Bless and you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was such, it was such a nice moment. And she was so happy and so excited. And, um, and then at the very end, when we see the evolution of how all of these spirits who had been so terrified and prejudiced against this human at the beginning are just cheering for her and and wanting her to beat Yubaba at her own game, and then she does. And it just, it touched my heart, and I liked it a lot. So that's, all all of my stuff are the, you know, the the really kind of sappy moments, but Mm -hmm. those are the things that get me the most in a movie. I, I love when she's at Zenobar's house and opens the door and you have this glorious shot of Haku as the dragon with his long tail behind him and his little chicken legs under him. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my one criticism of the film. I really don't like Haku's chicken legs. I think I, I would have preferred some, some slightly more robust griffin claws or something like that. They, they were just a little bit, um, a little bit spindly. Aww, see, and I didn't even notice. I was I was too busy. One being fearful that he was going to die, and then two being happy they were reunited. So yeah. it's it's only a nine out of ten with those uh, with those chicken legs. <laughs> uh, Matthew, what were your favorite parts? Uh, we've not mentioned the animation, but this is an absolutely gorgeous film. 
um, all the all the way through the stylized nature of some of the some of the spirits of uh, Chihiro herself. She's not she's not a stereotypical looking Japanese anime character, but but neither is Lin, neither are uh, the witches, anything in it really. But there's some absolutely perfect shots in there where she's running through the field of flowers and you see them whipping past her as she's trying to get out. Uh, Yubaba opening all the doors in front of her and her being thrown through them. Um, and the gorgeous shots across the, the ocean where you see the town hazy in the distance and the boat coming towards them. Yeah, it was definitely a beautiful movie. And then there's, there's little bits of the animation that I adore. When the stink god first approaches them uh, and you have the great comedy of them trying to speak through their mouths so they don't smell him. Um, on the subtitled version, they even type it in, in the subtitles in such a way that you can see they're doing that, that their noses are trying to be blocked. Um, and you have uh, Sen reacting like she's a cat. You can see the sort of ripple of fur going up and down her as she's smelling this disgusting thing coming towards her. <laughs> Yubaba herself, every time she uses her power, she's Im- it's so impressive when she flies over to Chihiro or when she's spitting fire at Haku and the baby's gone missing. She she looks grand and impressive for such an unusual looking character with this giant head, giant nose, huge hair and very European styling about her. But she really looks like she, she could do damage to anyone. Although the one time she tries to, she's completely ineffectual. But so often is the case with an antagonist in a Charles film. <laughs> I will say that she was really, really creepy. And had I seen this as a child, I might have had nightmares about her. Would that have been um, sort of made easier with how much Xenobart looks like her, but is actually quite a nice grandmother? Maybe, but since the movie ends with Yubaba, I don't know. I don't know. Like Catherine says, the the fact that Yubaba is an antagonist, but you can understand what she's doing. She's trying to run this uh, business, and she clearly knows what she's doing. When the stink gods come in and she finds the, the bicycle, she knows how to go and help and how to get something from this and how to run the business, despite also being a witch who's stealing from her sister. And even Zenaba comes across as a lovely old woman, but when she first appears and she changes the baby into the mouse um, and the bird into the small flappy bird, she does say something to um, Sen along the lines of, if you tell anyone about this, I'll rip your mouth off. Yeah, I, I actually think Zenaba is a little bit more sinister than you, Baba, if mm-hmm. it, at, at the end of the day. I think to a certain extent, you, Baba, is all bluster. She's all big hair and shouting and fire out of her mouth, but you never actually see her do anything significantly bad to anyone. Uh, and almost at the end, when um, you know when Chihiro calls her granny, at the end, it sort of it seems to almost undo her. She sort of lost lost a lot of her her bite by the end. But but in contrast, like Zeniba, when you at, when you're at her house, she you know, she's this lovely old lady, she feeds them, she does spinning. Um but she did actually do something unpleasant to the baby and the the little bird that became the mosquito, the whatever it was. Um and, and yeah and, and when she tells Sen, if you tell anyone I'll rip your mouth out, that's a properly sinister thing to say. Uh, whereas you Baba's all about controlling everyone with the force of her personality, but I don't think we actually saw her do anything horrible in the end. But I can I can totally see Randy that she would be scary if you were a small child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zaniba did freak me out at first too, and I was thinking the way that they constructed her house, I was thinking, oh my gosh, she's gonna eat them. <laughs> Because I was getting some yes, real, I could see that. <laughs> like, Hansel and Gretel vibes. Like, this is the gingerbread house. And then there was a spinning wheel in the corner. And so I was, you know, starting to relate this to all of the fairy tales that, that I grew up with. And all of the clues that you would get in those fairy tales that the witch is evil or the grandma is evil were all in her house. <laughs> I must admit, I was a little bit distracted when, when they went into her house this time by going, look at her yarn shelves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I missed that. I, I should have noticed that, but I didn't. I was distracted by the weird door and then the giant fire and the spinning wheel. And I was I was certain that they were all going to die. And I was very happy to find out that she really was, you know, nice when they didn't give her a reason to be mean. 
and and perhaps the sort of the mean aspect of her that we saw when she was at the bathhouse, really, it was nothing more than sibling rivalry and sisters that are having a spat, uh, and that that's sort of what's triggered her 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 mean spiritedness in that moment. Yeah, that's that's what I saw. Is she? I mean, she was there because her sister sent somebody to steal something very important to her. And so she was doing what she had to do to get it back. And I think her assumption, and this is actually me completely speculating, but I think her assumption would be that anybody who's at the bathhouse works for her sister and therefore is fair game. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. But at the end of the day, I much prefer Zaniba to you, Baba. So. <laughs> Catherine, what, what are some of your favorite parts of your favorite film? I think for me, it's uh, it's both the richness of the bathhouse scenes and then, in, in contrast, the simplicity of the scenes where she's riding the train across to Zenibar's house. Uh, I, th- I think I like them both equally. The, there are certain um, Japanese paintings where you've got the samurai's um, stronghold and, and in, the, in the painting you can see what's going on in every room with all the people and there's a real sort of richness and busyness and I've always loved those sorts of paintings. And, and uh, for me, the sort of the, the richness and busyness with all the gods and everything going on in the bathhouse scene and those rich gorgeous colors I, I love that just as a spectacle but equally then when she's riding the train and you've got this beautiful flat world and everything's so simple there's just there's a real piece to that that I, that I love just as much and I, and I think another moment that I really love is the, the spectacle of the parade that right at the beginning when the gods first arrive at the bathhouse off the boat and you can see all the different god characters sort of um, parading into the bathhouse. So, and again, I think one of the reasons I enjoy that is there's so much detail to enjoy so that every time I watch it, I can notice something slightly different about a different um, set of gods. That, that that's very much appealed to me um, and, and sticking on animation I think um, it's the animation of Chihiro's hair and Yubaba's hair someone in that animation team has got a real obsession with animating hair and I, and I love it there's just so much that it adds to adds to the the scene or also perhaps adds to our understanding of what's going on in the character's mind especially Yubaba's hair, as Matthew says, after the after she discovers Bo, her baby has gone. Um, it's fabulous. It's almost got a life of its own, like Rapunzel <laughs> entangled. So yeah, and, and and then the rat, the rat, the baby once it's become the rat is incredibly cute. In fact, we we have that downstairs in our fireplace. I almost wish that the baby had decided to stay a rat instead of becoming a baby again at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's a proper ugly baby, but a very yeah. cute rat. <laughs> yes. If the rat could have talked, then it would have been perfect. Mm. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, that moment where the the flappy bird is too tired to fly. And so the rat starts walking on its own and even turns its nose up at being carried and suddenly it's doing its own thing. Comes from nowhere, but again, you get a sense of development for a character. Lovely. But I think that ties into the greed is your downfall and you make an effort and you succeed again. Because up till now, the baby is just lying, laying there in its bedroom, greedily eating chocolates and has never managed to walk or stand on its own. And, and once it's been forced into making an effort, suddenly its, its developments come on and it can walk and be a bit more free. I do have one more thing mm-hmm. just to throw this out there at the end. When they finally come out at the end she's been restored her parents have been restored they're all together again and they come outside and it's very very clear that a lot of time has passed because the car is overgrown it's covered dust and leaves and everything but it leaves us with them still talking about going to this new house and I just found that strange because from my perspective they probably can't because They've been gone for, I don't know how long, but for a really, really long time. But it's clear that they can't just go back to normal. So why do you think they ended it that way? I don't think the parents knew how much time has passed. I think the parents, um, the whole period that Chihiro was trying to save them and they've been pigs, I, I don't think that's recognized, that that's sort of reflected in their memories or their understanding of the world at all. So I think as far as they're concerned, no time has passed. So they're going to get a horrible shock when they get to that house and there's another family living in it. Or it's just locked up and empty and someone's put all their belongings in storage. Right. Okay. 
I think it's um, it feels a little bit like South Park syndrome. The kids are very smart and know what's going on, and the parents are just oblivious. Okay. Yeah, I think. I mean, because I I didn't expect them to remember it, but I would have expected them to have a different reaction than you know when they see that their car has grown up because logically in the world that's not a thing that would happen so something must be wrong and they didn't even skip a beat they just wiped off the car got in it and drove away i I do think they're portrayed as a bit dense though i don't i didn't get a sense of warmth i mean okay they're not in it very long but i've never managed to feel a sense of warmth towards them almost i think that the mum character is really quite cold like, all she does is sort of, even when Chihiro is sort of cuddling up to her on the way out, and she's just like, oh, don't come so close, Chihiro. I, was just, I thought, I don't know, I, I I just don't like the parents. Oh, I don't like them either. I mean, her dad especially. <laughs> don't worry, I've got four-wheel drive. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to kill them, driving up this, like, weird mountain path. I, I can take all this food because I've got credit cards and cash. Yeah. He's not actually figured out how he's going to pay for it, but he knows he potentially can, so... And again, they're styled a bit differently than you would normally see. They drive an Audi. They they dress in quite European styles. They are they are bought into a sort of Western capitalism culture. That's true. Which leads back to the green, greed theme. And and I think the ending is one of the the main bits that I've heard is different in the dubbed or the subtitled version. Because I think Jahiro makes a comment about going back to school, and she says, "I think I'll I, I think I can handle it." I don't think she says that in the subtitle version. I think it is is literally a let's get on our way moment. Oh, well, that's sad, though, because that that line is the perfect ending to the movie. Mm. Because that brings it back to her and her growth as a character. And again, this is just making me want to watch the dubbed version, because I wonder if there's a slightly different slant sort of given to that element of the theme because whilst the uh, whilst the Japanese language version is definitely one of of growth and progression and and strengthening of Chihiro's character it, it's not quite so explicit about it at the end okay we're about to go and buy a blu-ray aren't we maybe <laughs> <laughs> well now i'm going to have to find time to watch the other version because it's on there i think i'm pretty sure mm. it's on there it should be yeah i think they generally come that way and we should perhaps revisit it if it's worth having the conversation. Okay. Mm. We can do that. Well, is there anything else that we need to discuss about Spirited Away? I feel like we talked about a lot, but there's so much to talk about with this movie. Mm-hmm. Is there anything we missed or left out? And it is one of the great things with children's films, isn't it, that, that they go so heavily on the theme. So it gives you a lot to discuss. But because children don't necessarily, certainly of this age, they haven't seen so much that they can pick up on some of the nuanced elements of a film. Yeah. Um, we've already got a couple of Studio Ghibli films on the list, uh, particularly Howl's Moving Castle and Kiki's Delivery Service. Uh, has this made you want to watch any more? Well, I always assumed I would watch Howl's Moving Castle just because some of our listeners love it so much. That that was never really a question, but now I think that I might actually enjoy it more than I thought I would to start with. Ha- have you read the book? No. No, I, I read the book, um, gosh, probably in my early teens, so long long before G- it, it was made into a Ghibli movie. And I just love Diane Wynne Jones's um, children's sort of fantasy literature. You know, they really, I, I just think that they're the slightly, slightly different slant to the stories, but I, I just, I think she creates a lovely, lovely, fantastical, magic filled world. Um, okay. And and actually, you know, Howl's Moving Castle is it, you know Diane Wynne Jones, as you can guess by her name, is not Japanese. So I, I mean, I really enjoyed seeing what is essentially a, um, you know a, a British, well Welsh, I guess, um, children's story, slightly Japanized in the um, in the telling. Okay. I don't think Japanized is actually a word, but never mind. It is now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I. I mean, I definitely want to do it. I think. The question has had, had always just been, what order would I watch these movies and not will I watch them? And I think Matthew and uh, everybody else thought Spirited Away would be the best entry point for me. And I liked it, so I guess they were right. So Yeah, well, I, I, th- I think they probably were right, definitely. Yeah. Um, I don't think I knew Kiki's Delivery Service was on the list, but I'm um, happy happy to watch it they, they snuck it in on you did they <laughs> i think they did but that's okay we'll get there the, those two are probably my favorite of the certainly the ones that i've seen 
um, the, the more recent films they've released, um, some of them have been uh, a lot more real world. In fact, some about real world characters. Um, but then the last couple have gone back to doing very heavy fantasy elements. In, in fact, the last one that was released at the cinemas has no dialogue in it, basically. Okay. Yeah. It was a bit strange. All right. But of course, it wasn't Miyazaki. Whilst it was Ghibli, it, it was one of the other creators within Studio Ghibli. So I think you, you, there are different creators that have very different styles while, while still being within the same sort of animation house. Mm, that's true. And Catherine, do you have any other recommendations to look at putting on Mandy's giant list of films she's never seen? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm always willing to recommend a film or two. It's just I don't know that my films that I, I, I love necessarily would fall into um, the category of, of a pop culture film that, that Mandy should have seen but dif- didn't. Um, I mean, I'm, I think you've, Mandy, I think you've already seen Labyrinth. Is that right? Yes. Yes, so so that would have been my my sort of pop culture recommendation. That's one of my all time favourite sort of. I've got a cold. I just want to be under a blanket and watch Labyrinth um, type type favourite films. So I guess in terms of fil- films that maybe you haven't seen, I definitely Second House Moving Castle as, as I've already said, and, and most of the Studio Ghibli films. If you're ever interested in watching a non-animated Japanese film, a couple that I'd recommend for very different reasons. Reasons there's one called Departures, which it's a, it's it's a beautiful film. It's very moving, but it's a slightly strange concept. Is a, a cellist who's looking for a change in career and actually uh, becomes a mortician. But it's a big examination of of him and and the place of morticians in, in, in Japanese culture and, and, and it's a lot more watchable than I've just made it sound um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then something that a very daft one but one that I very much have enjoyed where I watch is one called Ping Pong and it's a very silly um, Japanese film about um, about ping pong <laughs> table tennis but okay. I, I, I think it's a lot of fun I also just sticking on the same sort of I guess world, world films I have always loved uh, Shaolin Soccer which is a again a very silly Chinese film but it does a lot of um, spectacular sort of magic and acrobatics around soccer Matthew's pulling a face at me now I don't think he likes Shaolin Soccer so much <laughs> um, and, and I absolutely adored uh, two French films uh, Populaire about a typing contest very very fun film to watch and Amélie I, I, I love um, I love Amelie. Yes. Um, I love the the beautiful spectacle of Amelie. Uh, but, that but yeah, is the that's the only movie on this list that I have even heard of. <laughs> I think I have uh, less mainstream taste in films, perhaps. Which is wonderful because then you can tell me all of these films that I've never heard of <laughs> and should watch. So, uh, well, I will definitely keep these in mind. I'm not super well versed in foreign films, so I think having these kind of as possibilities is a good thing for me to help expand my horizons popular the the french film is a lovely lovely film really good fun in slightly in a kind of madmen vein because it's set in i think the 50s and it's about this sort of boss and, and typist relationship um and the main actors in in a number of different french films uh, he always does a good job in in whatever he puts out okay well i might have to see if i can find it i think i would probably be more interested in watching oh i cannot pronounce any of these things uh, <laughs> amelie is that how you said it emily emily <laughs> okay that you have one to say uh... it that way <laughs> <laughs> bear in mind that we are british people trying to pretend that we can do a french accent so you, you know your pronunciation is probably just as good as ours <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one is one that i've always you know, looked at with interest, but have never seen. So that one would probably be the the first French film that I watched. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful experience. What I would say is, it's not one to watch whilst you've got your smartphone in hand, because it is it is a film that for me is it's about the whole visual spect like visual spectacle, the music. It's not a film that's sort of very heavy in, on the dialogue. Okay. So, it's, yeah, it's definitely a watcher rather than a let me poke at my iPhone whilst I watch type movie. I try to, to like, pay attention when I'm watching stuff for the show. Um, I actually, sometimes I catch myself, like, 
Googling something or, you know, reading a tweet or whatever, and then I realize I've missed the last five minutes of the movie and I have to rewind it. And so then I have to like shut my laptop and just pay attention. But then I'm also supposed to be taking notes. And so I kind of sometimes get into this cycle. (laughs) But I do actively try not to look at anything other than my notes doc because Mm. I will get way too easily distracted and then I'll miss the things that I need to see in order to talk about these movies. I, I try and hide my iPhone or, or whatever I've got that when I'm if, if I really really want to watch a film I will knit instead of poke at my phone because I know then my my attention is far more on the screen rather than right. on the other screen that is distracting me in the corner. Right, I will have to try. I can't knit, but I crochet, so I will, you know, keep that in mind the next time that I'm finding myself distracted. <laughs> okay, well I think it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show where we go through our listener feedback. We heard from uh, Steve Jeffrey at Zinkstote, who said about the Rocky Horror Picture Show, great fun episode, guys. I learned a lot about a film I love, but I guess I'd never looked into the -the behind-the-scenes stuff before. You know, that's a comment that I get from folks a lot, is they they enjoy when we go through the history and production and, you know, when we can relate it to more of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff, because that's stuff that that most folks just don't know. Mm. So I think that's really cool. We also had uh, Jen at IU Girl Jen on Twitter. She left us a comment about the graduate episode, and she said she's surprised no one mentioned Rumor Has It, which is a bit of a sequel. It has Jennifer Aniston, Kevin Costner, Mark Ruffalo, and Shirley MacLaine. It came out in 2005, and they are the family that was the inspiration for the movie. Matthew, are you familiar with this movie at all? I'm not. We had a, a good conversation about it when uh, Jen was suggesting this. So I think it might be one to look out and uh, check out at some point. Yeah, because that's definitely a great cast. I would definitely be mm. interested in, in watching a movie with all of those folks together. So thanks, Jen, for the suggestion. We also had a comment from Kathy who left a, a comment on our website about the Rocky Horror Picture Show episode. And she said, great show. I'm so glad you like this movie. One of my favorite things is to watch the 70s BBC miniseries I, Claudius after watching Rocky Horror Picture Show because the actress playing Magenta is the evil scheming Lavala who has a relationship with a really young toupee Patrick Stewart. And also the larger male party guest from the castle plays Nero in I, Claudius. And I gotta say, Kathy, you've got me sold with a really young toupee Patrick Stewart. So I'm gonna have to find this one. I I hope he got toupee for that job. Oh, God, Matthew. (laughs) No dinner for you. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Okay. There are many ways that you can get in touch with us. So if you want to give us your comments on this or any other movie we've discussed, you can use the hashtag PCDeprived on Twitter. And you can find us on both Facebook and Twitter at Eloquent Gushing. You can also email us using podcast at eloquentgushing.com, or if you want to actually leave us a recorded voice message, you can go to speakpipe.com slash eloquentgushing and leave us a a voicemail. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. Catherine, it's been wonderful having you on the show, so arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, guys. It's been great joining you. We are also on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can gain access to exclusive content and help to support the network and develop new shows with us. To find out more, please visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. Please also remember to rate and review us on iTunes uh, to help other people discover the show. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest news and announcements, remember to subscribe to the weekly newsletter. The link is on eloquentgushing.com. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And if you make Sen cry, I won't like you anymore, Baba. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.